So we're going to continue this, our third part on how the earth became ancient, but today we're going to talk about assuming the earth is ancient according to uniformitarianism principles, and then let's test the premise and go through some thinking about how to actually test that. So the last couple weeks we've looked at science a little bit, and science is about doing hands-on experiments. So we looked at the octopus with the arms and the ink, and of course, as a scientist, you're going to lay your hands on stuff in the present and test it, alter variables, and see what happens, see what you can learn. So we put our hands on the octopus, chopped off his arms, and he still swam. And the end of the day, as you remember, does he swim using his arms? No. Then you discount that premise. Can he still move without an ink sack? Yes, so the ink sack is not important. It's not some kind of like airbag propulsion system. So you discard a premise that doesn't work. And then you end up realizing it's his funnel. So today, we're going to use that concept of kind of testing a premise and see how we go through thinking. So we're going to look at the battle. Uh, Pastor Mike was talking about this in the sermon today, about the believer's battle and spiritual warfare. We're going to look at rocks. Then we're going to look at fossils. And then we're going to ask whose testimony should we be paying attention to. So we'll start up here with the battle. And yes, life is a battle. We're in a fight. What happens in a cage fight if you try to put your head in the sand? How well does that work? Not very well, right? And if your head's in the sand, it's not on a swivel. And when your head's not on a swivel, you can end up in pretty bad places that you don't want to be. So we want to always be alert, awake, with our head on a swivel. Uh, here's God's Word, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone and ask you to give a reason for the hope that you had. So we talked about this one a couple weeks ago in our kind of big picture. Is it important to know what you believe? Yes, you have to know what you believe, but now how do you get a reason? It's not what, but why. It's how do you know why you believe it? Uh, you have to know why in order to give a reason. That's the real thing that I'm trying to do with this class is get us to stretch beyond just knowing what and what answers are, but why and how to think about them. Number one, to give a reason for our faith, we must be able to explain why we believe it. So here's a guy, Charles Templeton, back in the 40s. He was an evangelist along with Billy Graham. Uh, he'd went to Princeton Theological Seminary, and over the years, he ended up abandoning the faith. Uh, he's dead now, but he wrote this book, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. A sad story, but some of the things he says, why does God's grand design require creatures with teeth designed to crush spines or rend flesh, claws fashioned to seize and tear, venom to paralyze, mouths to suck blood, coils to constrict and smother? even expandable jaws so that prey may be swallowed whole and alive. So he looks at the world and asks that question. So with why, what is he doing? He's, well, he's questioning God, but what he's doing here is he's writing his reason of why he's rejecting the Christian faith, because why would a God do this and call it good? So you have this problem uh, theodicy is what it's called. How do you have an all-loving, all-powerful God existing in a world with death, evil, suffering? How do you have that? There has to be a deficiency in God or a deficiency in your understanding. One of those two. He says, nature is, in Tennyson's vivid phrase, red in tooth and claw, and life is a carnival of blood. How could such a loving and omnipotent God create such horrors as we have been contemplating? So he's, that's a synopsis of his book of why he rejected God. Number two, Templeton explains why he rejected God. The reason was simple, evolutionism. With ism, that's the belief in evolution. That's what it was. A different guy is saying you simply can't any longer say as traditional Christians that death was God's punishment for sin. Death was around long before human beings. Death is a necessary aspect of an evolutionary world. One generation has to die for new generations to come into being. In a way, it's more satisfying than to see it as a sort of arbitrary punishment that God imposed on our primeval paradise. Arbitrary, nothing arbitrary about it. All through Scripture, notice God says, if you do this, here's what happens. If you do that, here's the consequence. There is nothing arbitrary with God. So this was Ian Barber. 
Uh, and he received the 1999 Templeton Prize for what? For progress. So what is progress? Progress from our world is rejecting God. Number three, the world gives a prize for rejecting God, calling that rejection progress in religion. The world gives a prize for rejecting God, calling it progress in religion. Here's another Templeton Award winner. And you notice he's a vicar, so these are people in the ministry. My primary aim is to demonstrate the age of the earth, or rather the vast age of the rocks, for the simple reason that if the earth is more than 50,000 years old, biblical literalism is a dead duck. If I can persuade someone that the earth is at least a million years old, I consider the battle to be won. So you can see why this vast age of the earth is so critical for allowing evolution that allows people to reject God. Charles Hodge, uh, he is from Princeton Seminary. That's where Templeton went. He was back in the 1800s. Here's what he wrote. <clears throat> It is, of course, admitted that taking this account, by that he means the book of Genesis, by taking Genesis by itself, it would be most natural to understand the word day, yom, we talked about that a couple weeks ago with evening, morning, number, that's a regular day. That'd be the easiest thing to understand that word as a day in its ordinary sense. But if that sense brings the Mosaic account into conflict with facts, do facts speak, speak for themselves? They must be interpreted. He's saying facts speak for themselves with millions of years. That's other people's interpretation of facts. So if one, if taking Moses straightforward comes in conflict with facts, and another, meaning, oh, they're not really days, they're long periods of time, if that avoids such conflict, then it's obligatory on us to adopt the one that doesn't have the conflict with what man says. He goes on, the church has been forced more than once to alter Scripture in light of science, but this has been done without any violence to the Scriptures or in any degree impairing their authority. He rejected evolution. He simply accepted the old age of the earth, and he said the, ch the church has been forced to alter Scripture without impairing the authority of Scripture. Well, you just submitted Scripture underneath man, and whoever says they speak for science now can trump the church. Just think about that. So here's the slippery slide of Princeton Theological Seminary. We just looked at Hodge, did not accept evolution, but he did accept the millions of years in the old earth. Then his son, A. A. Hodge, entertained theistic evolution, didn't teach it, but entertained it, and then he was followed by B. B. Warfield, who taught that God created using evolution. Warfield died in 1921. That was the foundation of movement in that seminary. And Templeton enrolled 20 years after that where it's full-on evolutionary teaching. Did you know <clears throat> the more years of education a pastor has, the more likely they are to reject the notion of absolute truth? It's a fascinating thought. I'll say it again. The more years of seminary and training a pastor has, the more likely they are to be rejecting the concept of absolute truth tells you who controls the education system. Started with Hodge rejecting simply the age. This is what the world calls progress because we get rid of that pesky thing of absolute truth coming from God. What does Christ say about this? If I told you early, uh, earthly things and you did not believe me, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? What is he saying? My whole word from the beginning through now Christ gives his word, and I tell you things about history. I tell you things about nature. I tell you things that are real that you can go out and verify. If those things are not true, why would you ever believe what I'm teaching about morality or eternity? So Christ himself puts the veracity, the truthfulness of his word, and what he tells us about eternity hinges on the fact that he's accurate with worldly things. If he's not, he himself says, why would, you, why would you buy it? Why would you follow me? So that is the history book of the world, our scripture, and truth has to be consistent with reality. That's what Jesus says in John 3. It, what I teach is consistent with reality. How about faith? Here's our faith, Hebrews 11:6. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So two components, your premise does not need to be proven. You can choose any premise you want. You always hold your premise by faith. 
The question is, when do you discard a premise when the faith is shattered enough? So you hold a premise by faith, you don't need to defend your premise. What is the premise of Scripture? You must believe what? God is. What's number two? He's a rewarder. So what is his character? His character got you right in the eye. Uh, his character is good. Number four, the twofold premise of Scripture is, A, God is. He self-exists in the manner that he reveals himself. Nothing different, nothing less, nothing altered the way he reveals himself. And B, God is good. That's how you have a theodicy right there, is you start with that. We're not going to get into that one today, but that's the only way you can go about answering why there's death, evil, and suffering in the world, is you have to start with God being eternal, all-powerful, and a creator, and good, and his word is true, and this fallen world is not what he created. So let's move to number two here. We're going to look at rocks. So we've looked these, we've been building what we're doing, looking at this geologic time scale. Remember our textbook, uh, so this is our graduate level text. That's what we're going to be talking about when we listen about what evolution says. They tell us this is a created concept. It was not a field exercise, it was an exercise in logic that rocks accurately measure time. That's the fundamental premise. That's where the millions of years comes from. It doesn't come from radiometric dating. Relative dating was an exercise in logic based on the following assumptions. Number one, younger rocks on top of older ones. Older ones laid down first, and it's successive layers of stuff. Number two, we're going to look at that one later, so don't worry about it. We're just talking about the rock layers. Was it based on observation? Lyle made his first book before field exercise. It was theory, and he was an attorney. He knew what he was doing. It was philosophically driven. And they tell you this was not a field exercise. This was an exercise in logic. That's where the millions of years comes from. And that means there's assumptions. There's going to be deductive and inductive reasoning. Number five, the geologic time scale requires that rock layers accurately measure time. If they don't, now the philosophy breaks down. You have to have the right glasses to see uh, what, according to natural, naturalistic philosophy, what it would mean. So we look at the Grand Canyon, and we're going to just look at, the, maybe, uh, you're going to look at how there's rocks on the bottom would be the older ones, and then rocks on the top would be younger. And that makes sense if there was a layer, and then a layer, and then a layer spread out over millions and millions of years. That could be true. But it also could be true that some part all went at once, and it might have been a year later, two years later, 50 years later, another batch comes. We'll look at some stuff that we know happened like that. Of course, nobody saw this form. Uh, but the flood would basically bury stuff. That would create these, and then some kind of a dam breach is how you break through and carve the canyon. That would be a biblical model. So here we're looking at rocks. You can see there's a coal seam. Look at these layers of rock. You'd have got a dude standing there. What's the problem you see with assuming each of these layers could be tens to hundreds of thousands of years, measuring up to millions? What's the problem with that? Oh, what is that? Yeah, that's a tree. So that's a fossil tree. You could call that polystrate, a polystrate fossil, poly many, strata, a strata would be one layer, polystrate some kind of a fossil going through multiple layers. See that? That would be called a polystrate fossil. Well, they don't like it being there because what's the premise? The premise is lots and lots of time, one layer at a time. How long is that tree sticking out? It's fossilized now, right? So there's tangible evidence that starts to wrestle a little bit with your chosen premise. Now remember lithology, when they started making the geologic time scale, they used rock types. They discarded that. There's no way to get time out of it. That's why you don't ever hear about it anymore. But even back in the 1800s, by studying rock type, they realized something. The layers with these fossils, and sometimes it's fish and leaves that span layers. Those aren't going to be sitting there a long time. So they realize the rock layers that have these kind of fossils have the same minerals as rocks that don't. 
So you can't say they're a different type of rock. Here's one. Coal seam, coal seam. Those are millions of years apart. Layers, see the tree. There's another one. Look at all the layers. Here's this tree. Where is the evidence of soil? Remember, Darwin said in his book, you look at today the slow rates of soil deposition and erosion. It's got to take millions of years to stack up these sedimentary layers. Sedimentary means laid down by water. I wonder what a water source could be. So sedimentary layers with a fossil spanning however many thousands to millions of years that's supposed to be. Where's the soil and where's the erosion? It's never there. So I just looked up, uh, this is a talk origins, that's an evolution site to see, because my textbook says nothing about polystrate fossils. How about talk origins? Well, here's what they say. It's hard to see, but they say here's a creationist claim, 331, uh, that polystrate fossils present a problem for uniformitarianism. Uh, here's their response. Sudden deposition is not a problem for uniformitarian uh, geology. Single floods, so you notice they're using little, little catastrophes, you can't have a big one. Single floods can get rock layers several feet thick. And you can have tree stumps that last in there for decades. Did they answer the question? They didn't answer, they didn't even delve into the assumptions behind the issue. The issue is millions of layers and you've got a fossil sticking between them. So they say, well yeah, a flood can get something several feet thick, who cares? I'll show you one in a, in a minute where there's multiple feet thick on a flow, but it, we're talking about ones that span several layers, not just one thick layer. So that's an irrelevant distraction, and they never talk about it affecting time. So, yeah, so a tree could sit for decades, but it ain't going hundreds of thousands of years, for sure not millions. So they don't even answer the question. So here we're going to look at, this is Grand Canyon. 25 feet in one day. Now, that was videotaped, so everyone knows that. These layers, see the layers? And then several weeks later, another mud dam broke, and this was one other flow. Look how thick that is. That was a big mud flow. But all of these with different layers was also one flow. It wasn't one, then another, then another. And that was witnessed up at Mount St. Helens. Gordon was asking about Mount St. Helens last week. There's a ton of stuff there that we don't have time to get into. Number six. True or false, man has witnessed rock layers get deposited quickly. That's true. Look at Mount St. Helens. So we should start with things that we know are true rather than pontificate on things that we don't. Well, the premise is, look at all the layers. The premise is one layer on top of another, on top of another over millions of years. How do you fold a rock? Huh. That seems interesting. Let's see, is that, nope, I guess there's more of those. You can see them all over the place. So how do you fold these rocks? There's a hammer for scale, Look that big S-curve. Look at all the layers and look at that super S-curve. And you notice they aren't broken. Even microscopically, there's no fracture in the rock. How do you bend a rock? Well, this is Grand Canyon to Pete Sandstone. Huge rocks. Are you sure they're big? Yeah. Look at the people. Going horizontal, going vertical. How do you do that? That's a lot of folding of rock. Now, I could see breaking a rock, but how do you fold a rock? So here's just a diagram. So we were looking at the uh, Tapete Sandstone right there, and that's 550 million years old according to uniformitarian, according to evolution. So 550 million years old. Now, at some point in the past, there was this folding that bent the rocks. Well, when did that happen according to their time scale? That was 70 million years ago. So if it's five, this bottom one, if that's 550 million years old, minus 70 years, that means those rocks were hard. They had 480 million years to harden before they moved. You could argue six months to a year, you could, you know, who, by five years at St. Helens, stuff was solid rock. So you're not really going to be able to go more than five years, but you could argue a short period of time, but how do you argue your rocks were able to be folded without fracturing after 480 million years? I sense a problem with the premise. There you see another one. Weaving around, more horizontal weaving, going straight north. Look at the dudes. Those are big rocks. 
They're hard rock. How do you bend hard rock without fracturing it? Or was it more like taffy? Was it freshly laid down? But that would require not having millions of years between each of those layers. That would mean they were laid down more at the same time, and while they were still soft like taffy, you had an upwarp, volcanic activity, that sort of thing, and you move it. That fits with a biblical model of a flood far more than it does the uniformitarian. They were most likely, in order to get that, you have to come up with a premise to interpret that data. My premise would be those look like they were laid down and soft at the same time that they started to lift. That would make much more sense to me. Number seven, it would be very difficult to bend thick, hardened rock without fracturing it. Go do an experiment on your own, see how well it works. So here you have Burlingame Canyon, that's up in Washington. There's a dude for time scale. These are rhythmites, as so we're going to probably look at the Lake Missoula flood a little bit next week. That's when these were formed, all from one flood. These were not spaced out over millions of years, and there's reasons you can demonstrate that. So here you see Lake Missoula was over here, a glacial lake, and it breaches a dam, uh, helps with our Willamette Valley we live in here, and that is where Burlingame Canyon is as you go out to the Pacific Ocean. So it was backlogged, built the layers. When was this canyon carved? That was in the 1920s, witnessed. There was a big uh, flood, a local flood. It was a drainage ditch, breached its dam, and carved this big canyon. It took six days of flooding, and then there's your canyon. So it was formed rapidly, the layers, and then you carved the canyon rapidly. Didn't take millions of years. Nobody saw this be formed, the layers, from the Lake Missoula flood, but they figured out how it worked. And, of course, it was witnessed, the six-day flooding that carved the canyon out. Where's the millions of years? Number eight, floodwaters can carve canyons quickly. And this happens in Iceland and all over the place when they actually witness this happening. Now, when we go back to our textbook, they say the millions of years, which means rocks accurately measure time, that conclusion was driven by data. Derek Ager is not in this book. Uh, he's an atheist, so he's not a Christian, a creation guy. But he, different from Lyle, who started writing before he ever went on a trip, Ager is a world expert, wrote a textbook of the stratigraphic record, Layers in the Earth, and he adheres to neocatastrophism. So he already rejects the Bible millions of years, but he realizes uniformitarianism does not create all the land features that we have. It doesn't even come close. You have to have floods and dam breaches and stuff like that to do it. But that was rejected by uniformitarianism because they had to get the millions of years. He says, I've been trying to show how I think geology got into the theoretician's hands. By that, he means the uniformitarian guys who are conditioned by the social and political history. What is that? That's the desire to get rid of Moses of their day in the early 1800s more than observations in the field. And this is an atheist. He's not on our side of the street. So the text says the conclusion of millions of years was driven by data. This world expert says, no, that's not true. It was not observations in the field. It wasn't really data. It was social and political history of their day. He's exactly right. Huh. And he's an atheist. So I always like to ask why. Why is he now willing to share this stuff? He's already an atheist. The battle has been won. Look at the school system. Nobody teaches catastrophe. It's all uniformitarianism. It's all millions of years. So they've already gotten rid of Moses. They've already gotten rid of God. So he doesn't see the philosophical need for the battle that they had 150 years ago. So he can say, why don't we be real scientists and use our glasses? Because that contradicts the millions of years. Right? But he's already bought the millions of years. He even says this is mind control. We've allowed ourselves to be brainwashed into avoiding any interpretation of the past that might involve extreme and what might be termed catastrophic processes. Brainwashed. Wearing only a certain set of glasses. Looking at the geologic time scale and thinking rocks must actually measure time, but that's a created concept. So we look at the passage of time, uniformitarianism, evolution would say, this process of passage of time is important. I've got a little clip that'll explain Governor this. Governor and I, and we were all 
um, doing a tour of the library here and um, talking about the significance of the passage of time, right? The significance of the passage of time. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay these wires, what we need to do to create these jobs. And there is such great significance to the passage of time when we think about a day in the life of our children. So I figured that would clear it all up. There's great significance to the passage of time. So you can listen to foolishness, which anyone can spot. Let's compare that to looking at wisdom. What does Christ say? He's telling about a guy. I will say, not Jesus, but this guy, a rich guy. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry, retire, don't engage in the battle. But, and when God says but, you need to read what comes next. God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. Do you see the difference between that psychobabble you can't understand, and wisdom teaching about the importance of time? Are you using your time wisely? It comes from the Lord Almighty, and it's very clear what he's saying, don't be a fool. So here's a question. Does God say anything in Scripture about rocks and time? Come on. What's that? Oh, Aaron Haas. The Israelites used them all the time as memorials. The Ebenezer Stone, you cross the River Jordan, and you stack what? Paper? Rocks. Rocks withstand time. They sit there. They're static. They're stationary. They're a memorial of an event despite the passage of time. They're not used to measure time. Look at how God views rocks differently than us. Are they a measurement of time? No, not at all. God says they are used as memorials. What did he write the Ten Commandments on? Stone, rock. Memorials of events, not measurement of time. Number nine, God uses rocks to memorialize events, not as a way to measure time. So we look at this. Geologic time scale, what would it be a memorial of? What big event? Death. And what big one would get a lot of it? Oh, that was a weak toss here. The flood. The flood of Noah. Those, those uh, peanut butter cups curve quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> so now we're going to go look at fossils. So we realize fossils are a memorial of death. And they could be all sorts of death, but that's what fossils are in God's eyes. Here's a memorial in stone of death. It's not a measurement of time. So we're going to look at a fossil graveyard, and you could start with the Word of God, and you could look at that data and conclude, ah, sin leads to death, just like God says. And you know what? He had a big one in the past where he's going to marry billions of dead stuff in piles, fossil graveyards. How do you get a fossil graveyard with wash and stuff around? They weren't living there. It's where they were buried. That's a fossil graveyard, and they're all in sedimentary rock, which means delivered by water. Billions of years would be a different philosophy. You could say, no, 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 we want to believe that rocks accurately measure time, and they accurately measure when things live, and you're going to look at that, and now you could conclude the geologic time scale. But without the millions of years and without rocks accurately measuring time, you cannot come to this. So we're going to do science. We're going to take a hatchet to the arms of the octopus. How could we use science to test the premise that rocks are an accurate record of when things live? That's what we're going to look at. If this is a measure of time, doing it accurately, how would you know when something went extinct? What's that? Based on how deep it is, that, and I, I, I can't quite hear Aaron over there, but yeah, so you'll, you'll have a line, okay? This is about 70 million years ago. If you're fossilized below that, but not after that, you're called extinct, right? And then there's various examples. Here's one, the coelacanth, a very interesting one. 
It goes from the Devonian up to the Cretaceous, so it's, these are where it's fossilized in the fossil record, but it's not fossilized up there. Therefore, it must be extinct. And then they caught it, 1930s. Whoa, he's not extinct, it's a big, ugly fish. And it's, it could be, it doesn't mean one fish is several hundred million years old, but this type of fish goes back even deeper than dinosaurs. And when they caught it, they had an expert look at it. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. There's different species names of them, but that's what it is. Uh, it's the coelacanth fish. Look at those legs. What they were teaching is that this was in its way to evolving to walk on land. No, it's not. It's a very skillful swimmer. It goes deep on these cliffs. It can turn all around. A very skillful swimmer. It's not using those fins to walk. But when it's a fossil, you can make up all sorts of stories if it's extinct. When it's alive, you can actually study the real thing. So there it is. Alive with humans today or not? Yes, they've caught them. Here's the question. Are they fossilized in the same layers? They don't have to be right next to each other, but are in the same layers of rock with humans? No, you're right, Gordon, they're not. That's why they said it was extinct. They were down clear to the Devonium and up to the Cretaceous, up where the dinosaurs are, and they're not in the intervening layers, but here they are on the earth. So that's where they're fossilized. So if it ain't here, it's got to be extinct. It is not fossilized in those layers, yet it's alive with humans today. On, that's just the very top crust is where humans are in this. So it's alive with us today. Number 10, living fossils contradict the entire concept of the geologic column in the geologic time scale. There's a, what, anyone know what that is? A horseshoe, how do you know what a horseshoe crab is? Ah, she used to, she's, she's mean, used to step on horseshoe crabs. They're alive today, several of them. You can see how they look on the bottom side, and there's fossils of them. They can identify exactly what they are. Here's what our textbook says about, it's the only thing they say about living fossils, they bring up the horseshoe crabs, that's why I put it in here. Horseshoe crabs are a spectacular example of an entire clade of living fossils. What's a clade? That's a, so things that come from a common ancestor. Look where that is in the textbook. Here's your text. It's about 900 pages. It's on page 708. Do you think you get there in a one-semester class? No. You never even talk about those. I, I took a graduate-level evolution course. I never, we never talked about uh, living fossils. We never talked about polystrate fossils either. Why? Why do they stash it way back there? Because remember all the stuff on the geologic time scale and the assumptions, they're even telling you it's all philosophy, getting the millions of years, that's on page 60. You spend time understanding that because that's where the millions of years come from. They go on. The extant, that means the living species in the, this genus Limulus are virtually identical. You can't tell they're the same things going in the fossil record to fossil species from a different family that existed 150 million years ago. They're all the same family. That's a whole different thing. Species has nothing to do with evolution, making a new species. Family and genus is where you got to go, but that's a topic for another day. While some horseshoe crab lineages stayed virtually unchanged, look at this. The entire radiation, all of the evolution from not being there to being there fully of birds, mammals, and flowering plants took place and these stupid crabs never changed. Wow, how accurate are we measuring time? You could also ask, where's the evolution? So here's what the textbook says on why are we not seeing the evolution of these crabs. The current view is that there is no explanation. And they try to dress it up by no single injection. They don't have a clue is the answer. They don't have a clue. There's no explanation for the low rates of morphological change that occur in a particular lineage. You notice how they shifted? They're talking about, boy, it's kind of interesting. The horseshoe crab doesn't change much during all the time where these animals and plants and mammals all came from not even being here to their full evolution. So they talk about a lack of evolution and never once mention the premise that this defies their belief that the rocks are measuring time. They never talk about time once. They're avoiding the issue. Why do you think that is? Because people don't like their premise to be questioned when it's pure faith. That's why we can't be idiots as Christians, and we can't hold to various things purely by faith. We have to know what our faith-based premise is. God is, and He is good. Everything else follows logically from there. And they're also not extinct. 
Look at what's that? Platypus. Gordon has one. That's why he knew what that was. Uh, Gordon's got to work on his hands a little bit. Maybe new glasses, Gordon. But the platypus is not extinct. When things aren't extinct, you can't make up stories about them. When they're extinct, you can make up all sorts of stories about their evolution. Imagine finding that in the fossil record not alive today. That's a beautiful example of a missing link, except it doesn't work. I think God mocks them by having it still alive today so they can't tell stories about it. But what is never addressed? I showed you an evolution side on polystrate fossils. The textbook never mentions those. And the textbook thing on living fossils is extremely brief and distractioning. It's a big distraction. Because here's the premise. Rocks are an accurate record of time. They can't allow data that clearly runs contrary to that because you have to interpret your data. Remember what page the living fossils were on? Page 708 and 709, it's on two different pages there because they're just good. It's one paragraph on two pages. End of the book. Number 11, evolutionism tries to avoid discussion of concepts that challenge its premise, that being that rocks accurately measure time. So they talk about this lack of evolution. The horseshoe crab goes clear back to here, all the way up to here, with no evolution. Wow. This is invertebrates down here in the Precambrian. That's just above the Cambrian. That's where everything starts. How is that measuring time if you're not changing at all? There's no explanation because that's a made-up premise. They invented the concept. So why do they not mention it? Because rocks don't measure time. So we go back to the Grand Canyon and we look at this. There should be older ones on the bottom. You should have younger ones on the top if you're laying them down in sequence. But that's assuming they measure time. They might not have been laid down in sequence over millions of years. Here's a wallamy pine. That's alive today. But it was supposed to be extinct 200 million years ago. Is it ever fossilized with humans? No, that's the definition of a living fossil. Never fossilized with humans. So here we look. That's where it see it's deeper than the last one. This is where it is last seen in the fossil record. But there it is. I don't think the fence was in the fossil record. So people will say, yeah, but humans have never been found with dinosaurs in the fossil record. Hmm. This is interesting. You'll hear that argument all the time. Let's just simply use, let's assume that's true. Let's assume there's, there's various things, there's all sorts of historical records where very clearly they lived at the same time, but let's just go here with logic. Yeah, man was never fossilized with dinosaurs. Therefore, man never could have seen or lived with a dinosaur. Why? Because the rocks accurately measure time, and man and dinosaurs are never found clearly fossilized together. Let's just accept that. But think of the logic. Do the facts speak for themselves, or must they be interpreted? So we're testing the premise. Number 12, for rocks to accurately measure time, things living together today must be fossilized together. As far as we know, are there dinosaurs today? You could use a Komodo dragon and stuff like that. But if we say, okay, those dinosaurs that we all know are the cool ones, let's just say there's not a single one of them anywhere on the earth. Does it matter philosophically? Because if you are living at the same time, you have to be fossilized together in the same layers. That's required. The truth must be consistent with reality. If you're alive today, if the rocks accurately measure time, you must be buried in the same layers. You don't have to be side by side. One could be in Africa, one could be in Australia, but they'd have to be in the same layer, right? How do you know when something went extinct? It ain't found after that level, whatever the level is. But that's true only if they accurately measure time. How many living fossils, they all fit the same definition, found down there, not anywhere in the last several hundred million years in some cases, yet alive today with man, yet not ever fossilized with man. How many of those? I showed you three. There's one museum in England, one little museum that has over 500. So there's at least 500 of these living fossils. The same philosophical issue as walking around with a dinosaur. So philosophically, finding a horseshoe crab, a coelacanth, or a little fern, 
isn't nearly as cool, and I realize in the movie they got the DNA and remade them, so I, I understand that. But if you found a living dinosaur, would be such cool news. Finding these other things just doesn't seem cool, so everyone thinks they can just kind of never talk about it. But philosophically, it's the exact same thing. The rocks don't actually measure time. It's a created concept. It's not a measurement of time. How does it measure time? There's only one way. You've got to wear the right glasses of uniformitarianism. So, you could look at this and say, you know, a flood could easily deposit these layers, and then a later dam breach could carve the canyon. That's, we've witnessed that in a lot of things. That could work, but that's catastrophism. It doesn't require millions of years. Or you could say, nope, only very slow and gradual, and what got the millions of years was very strict uniformitarianism that was proposed in direct contrast to catastrophism. Simple test. If you're alive at the same time, you need to be fossilized together. Deal with stuff in the real world. This kid's testing the frog, right, in live time. So what's the only way to test the premise? If you're living together today, you must be fossilized in the same layers. You must, or the premise is false. You could always have one or two examples that maybe would be a special case, but not hundreds and hundreds of them. Not when you can see it alive today. If things living together today, if you're living together like us and those three that I showed you, you must be fossilized together. That's the definition of a living fossil. They're not. Therefore, the premise can't be true. It can't measure time. If I've showed you three, the coelacanth and the horseshoe crab and the wallamy pine, there's over 500 of them that are not fossilized above a line like, so it's not way up here and just having 50,000 years. We're talking about a huge gap of millions and millions of years. Yet they're alive with humans today up on the top. Did they live here in the tertiary? No one says they went extinct and re-evolved. They had to be living here. Yet they left no fossil record that people can tell of living there. Maybe the rocks don't measure time. So we can look at a dude. Here's a guy standing up there. And why are we so dogmatic? that there's no way he lived anywhere down here simply because we're not aware of a bunch of fossils. Well, I just showed you a bunch that have lived where they weren't fossilized because the rocks don't measure time. Do not answer a fool according to his folly or you'll be like him. If we say, yes, we're going to accept the concept of millions of years by uniformitarianism, we're going to accept that premise, now they win the debate because Rocks measure time. I would challenge the premise. Don't answer a fool, or answer him as a folly deserves, not according to his premise, and show him how his premise is wrong. I don't believe your premise is right that the rocks accurately measure time. I've just showed you 500 examples. So why do you say a man couldn't have lived somewhere down in here? Or like the Bible says, we all started together and went up, and not everything is fossilized in every layer because it's a memorial of death, not a measurement of time. So the last one we're going to look at is real briefly this as a thought experiment. Earlier life forms, stuff on the bottom, should be simpler than more recent stuff on the top. That's evolution. And the more recent, most similar to what's existing today. So let's just kind of look at this. Simple down there, more similar to what's alive currently towards the top. We're going to think about this. We're going to have one skull, A. I'm going to have another skull, B. We're going to put them together. I'm going to ask you, which one is more simple? Okay, we have a couple votes for A being more simple. Uh, at least they're willing to talk, all right? So we've got a couple votes that A was more simple, which means it should be deeper, right? Well, which one's alive today? So I gave you a T-Rex. That's a softball, right? Is that alive today as far as we know? Outside of Jurassic Park, it's not. But here's, here's the point, number 13. It is possible to feel a philosophy when forced to answer questions. Because you don't know what that stupid fossil is right here, fossil A, if we could have it back up there. You're not sure what that is, so you're not sure how old it's supposed to be, so you're not sure what you're supposed to answer. Anyone know what it is? Gordon! Woo! I mean, you are stealing all my candy. Oh! He had three shots on it, almost brought it home. That is a black bear. It's alive today. I just picked one that looks like maybe it's some kind of saber tooth thing trying to make you get confused. So here's the column. 
way back here, the Cambrian, so invertebrates down here. This is where only simple stuff supposedly is supposed to be here. All of that together is about 540 million years. So now, which one is simpler? This single-celled organism or this multicellular fish? The single cell has got to be simpler, right? There it is. Okay, that's mycoplasma. That's alive today. One of the simplest organisms on the planet. Here's a fish. You can pronounce the name. There's the, the fossils. There's they have. It has a notochord in it. Well, it's way down there in the Cambrian. I, I thought it said invertebrates. There's the name, and that's, remember, it's 540 million years. That's 530 million years old. That's way down at the bottom complex, multicellular creature. So mycoplasma is alive today. So we're going to ask the question, because simple was supposed to be at the bottom. So which one of these is simpler? Well, that one. But it's alive today, very top. Which is more similar to what's living today? Well, this one is living today, so it has to be. But I've seen a lot of fish that are similar to that. So I'm confused. I thought it had to go in a progression. Now, of course, I'm just hand-picking some examples, but it runs totally contrary to the whole premise. Think. We're supposed to go simpler to more similar to what's alive today. So the last thing we'll do is just look at whose testimony. If somebody raised from the dead, how powerful would that be? Let's look at what Jesus says. This is not a parable, because in parables there's not a proper name. This is Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is a real dude. Jesus is telling the story. This must have really happened. It's not a parable. Uh, and the rich guy who's on the bad side of, Abraham, of uh, Hades answered and said, I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let your family listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead rises and goes to them, they will repent. What does Jesus say about that? Abraham, speaking, but Jesus telling the story, said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Wow. Who do they have? The book of Genesis. Number 14, according to Jesus, the testimony of Moses outweighs that of a resurrected friend. That is powerful. Now you see why Lyle thought and knew he had to get rid of Moses. Because Moses starts it right off telling us about who? God. And then God gives us history of the world. Uh, and this passage, I'm going to go fast. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose me must gently instruct and hope that God, God, We'll grant them repentance and knowledge of the truth. I was talking with Luke here last week. How come there's people you can talk about data and they will never see it? Well, they will come to the, hoping that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do as well. You can't do that. You need to be able to teach and be loving, but only God can work supernaturally in their life and cause the blinders to open up because there is a powerful foe. Mike talked about this in the sermon tonight with schemes. What premise do you believe and hold on to? Fifteen, the real reason many are resistant to the truth, capital T, of God's Word, is Satan. Second Timothy 2 explains that. So real science, you should test your premise, and like we did with the octopus, get rid of a bad premise. I've showed you very shaky areas of the premise with age of the earth, but there is a supernatural power in play. It's not simple. So we're going to pick up Psalms 19 next week. Uh, we won't talk about that today. Uh, we're going to close. So we looked at the battle. It's, an emo it's a mental, spiritual battle going on. We looked at rocks. There are memorials of events from God's Word. They're not a measure of time. That's man's way to get rid of God. Then we looked at fossils. Fossils don't follow a neat pattern like you would think for evolution. It's how do you interpret them, but I showed you three. There's more than 500 living fossils, and then fossil trees that span layers. Those are two big problems with the fundamental premise that the rock layers accurately measure time. And then whose testimony would you think? I would have thought a raised family member would be the best testimony I could hear. But Jesus says that's not true. It's Moses. That makes me think a whole lot more critically about how to read the Pentateuch that Moses gave us. So let's pray.
Dear Lord, I just thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you that we can gather together and study your word. Thank you for giving us rocks as memorials of events, that you are the creator, that you are sovereign, but you also speak truth, and there are consequences. We can follow you, which means submission, or we can reject you, which means death, and you've showed us billions of times over what the rejection of your word is. Help us to realize what the monuments are that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.